New York, this is Democracy Now! Residents of Burma protest Monday's military coup by banging pots and pans from their windows as ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi faces police charges. We'll look at what the coup means for Rohingya refugees who face decades of repression under the Burmese military. Now in Myanmar, the military have declared a one-year state of emergency. That announcement is not good for the Rohingya people, too, because the military, together with the Rakhine people, tortured us a lot and carried out genocide. Then they made us homeless. Then President Biden signs three new executive orders on immigration, even as hundreds have been deported. Advocates say far more needs to be done. We are working day in and day out with families that remain separated and tens of thousands of refugees who are stuck at the U.S.-Mexico border. And we were really disappointed to see that these executive orders do not offer any clear path toward reunification, um, nor that do they undo any of the harmful policies of the Trump administration. Finally, Jeff Bezos has announced he's stepping down as CEO of Amazon amidst new calls to break up the $1.7 trillion company. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. House Democrats say former President Trump was singularly responsible for the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol in a legal brief filed Tuesday ahead of next week's impeachment trial. The lawmakers write, quote, Trump summoned a mob to Washington, exhorted them into a frenzy, and aimed them like a loaded cannon down Pennsylvania Avenue. They also argue Trump's baseless claims of election fraud helped rile up his base. Trump's lawyers wrote in their own brief that Trump had a right to question election results and that the trial is unconstitutional since he's no longer in office. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden and First Lady Biden paid their respects to Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick, whose body lay in honor at the Capitol Rotunda on Tuesday evening. Five people lost their lives in the January 6th insurrection. Two officers died by suicide following the attack. The U.S. will start shipping coronavirus vaccines to retail pharmacies next week, making the shot much more accessible to many around the country. The Biden administration also said it's increasing the weekly vaccine allocation for states, tribes and territories by 5 percent, as public health experts urge speeding up vaccination as the best defense against fast-spreading variants. Top infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci said that 70 to 80 percent of the U.S. population should be fully vaccinated before the United States can return to a sense of normalcy. Less than 2 percent of the population has been vaccinated so far. In related news, preliminary data from a new study show a single dose of the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine could cut transmission of the coronavirus by 67 percent and offer protection from the virus with up to 76 percent effectiveness for as long as 12 weeks. The findings support the strategy that some countries have employed of spacing out vaccine doses to get more people rapidly inoculated. On Capitol Hill, Democrats are moving forward with President Biden's $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package, voting Tuesday to kickstart the budget reconciliation process, which would not require any Republican support to pass the legislation. In other news from Washington, D.C., the Senate confirmed Alejandro Mayorkas as head of Homeland Security Tuesday, making him the first Latinx and first immigrant to lead the department. The Senate also confirmed Pete Buttigieg as transportation secretary, making the former South Bend, Indiana mayor and presidential candidate the first openly gay cabinet secretary in U.S. history. Meanwhile, the Senate Armed Services Committee held confirmation hearings for Kathleen Hicks Tuesday, Biden's pick for deputy. Deputy Defense Secretary, Senator Elizabeth Warren questioned Hicks on the $740 billion defense budget, which Warren called unconscionable. 
We continue to overinvest in defense while underinvesting in public health and so much more that would keep us safe and that would save lives. So let me ask the question this way. Dr. Hicks, do you believe that we can find ways to lower the top line budget number and then spend that money more effectively without sacrificing our security. Kathleen Hicks responded, cutting the military budget would necessitate, quote, making decisions that may incur risk themselves. Senator Elizabeth Warren, who's joining the Senate Finance Committee, said her first order of business would be to introduce legislation implementing a wealth tax on fortunes over $50 million. The tax would likely affect 75,000 of the richest household. It's time to make the ultra-rich pay their fair share, Senator Warren said. Politico is reporting House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy is leaning toward removing far-right Congressmember Marjorie Taylor Greene from the House Education Committee after meeting with her Tuesday night. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell condemned her, quote, loony lies and conspiracy theories Monday, while House Democrats introduced a resolution to strip her of her committee assignments over her history of violent threats and racist, anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic comments. She's called for the killing of Nancy Nancy Pelosi and President Obama, and has questioned in the past whether, in fact, the mass shootings at the Sandy Hook Elementary School and Parkland High School were, in fact, false flag operations. In Russia, nationalist opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been sentenced to three and a half years in prison. Navalny will serve around two and a half years, since he has already served time under house arrest. His arrest has prompted mass street protests, with thousands detained in recent days. U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken and other officials around the world condemned the ruling and called for Navalny's release. In court, Navalny struck a defiant tone, again accusing Vladimir Putin of ordering his poisoning with the nerve agent Novichok in August and calling on his supporters to keep putting pressure on the Kremlin. You can't lock up the whole country, Navalny told the courtroom. Coronavirus vaccinations have started in the occupied West Bank after Israel transferred the first batch of a total of 5,000 doses to inoculate frontline Palestinian health workers after coming under fire for refusing to share its vaccines with Palestinians. This is a West Bank resident commenting on the arrival of vaccines. The vaccine is good, but they are only giving it to the healthcare workers, not to the public. The occupied territories are also expecting to receive 37,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine through the World Health Organization's COVAX scheme in mid-February. In the U.S., freshman New York Congress member Jamal Bowman called on Israel to vaccinate all Palestinians. He wrote, quote, as a black man living in America, I know the feeling of being neglected by my government and society, of feeling like a second-class citizen or not a citizen at all, Bowman said. In other news from the region, Serbia and Turkey have condemned Monday's establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Kosovo. Serbia objects to Israel's recognition of Kosovo's statehood as part of the deal, while Turkey says Kosovo's plan to open an embassy in Jerusalem is a violation of international law. Kosovo is to be the third country after the U.S. and Guatemala and the first Muslim-majority one to open an embassy in Jerusalem. Kosovo will also recognize Hezbollah as a terrorist group as part of the agreement. The normalization deal was announced by former President Trump last September. In Mexico, immigrant rights at in Mexico, immigration agents are under investigation for their possible involvement in the massacre of 19 people in the northern state of Tamaulipas. The 19 bodies were found shot and charred in a town near the U.S.-Mexico border in January. Relatives of asylum seekers from Guatemala say they believe some of the dead could be their loved ones, including teenagers who were trying to reach the U.S. Only four bodies have been identified. Two were Guatemalan, two were Mexican. Back in the United States, Jeff Bezos has announced he's stepping down as CEO of Amazon, the $1.7 trillion company he founded in 1994. 
Bezos Romain is executive chair and the company's biggest shareholder. Jeff Bezos is now worth about $185 billion after personally making over $70 billion since the start of the pandemic. Jeff Bezos will be succeeded in July by Andy Jassy, who runs Amazon's cloud computing division. In a 2018 interview with PBS Frontline, Jassy dismissed concerns about Amazon's market monopoly and the antitrust push against the company. We have a, a relatively tiny share of the overall market segments in the categories in which we operate. And then I think the other thing to remember is that consumers and customers have a choice on where they spend their money. Simply because Amazon decides to pursue a, a market segment doesn't mean the customers are going to spend their money there. Jassy also defended Amazon's decision to sell facial recognition software to police departments and foreign governments in the interview, though Amazon announced last summer it was banning police use of their facial recognition technology for one year amidst the historic Black Lives Matter and anti-police brutality uprising. In related news, Amazon will pay delivery drivers a settlement of $61.7 million after a Federal Trade Commission probe found it stole tips from its Amazon Flex drivers over two and a half years. Amazon used the tips earned by Flex drivers, hourly workers who do not receive any benefits and make deliveries in their own vehicles, to pay their wages. In South Florida, two FBI agents were fatally shot and three others wounded Tuesday morning in one of the deadliest shootings in the agency's history. The officers were shot while executing a search warrant in a child abuse case. The subject of the investigation was found dead and apparently barricaded himself inside an apartment complex. In Missouri, a 39-year-old black father died in the parking lot of a hospital after repeatedly being denied treatment. David Bell was turned away twice from the Barnes Jewish Hospital days before his death, despite reporting severe chest pain. On January 12th, he was denied proper treatment for a third time and died minutes later as his wife pushed him back to their car in a wheelchair. David Bell was a father of three and worked as board director at the local fire and rescue center. And here in New York, an anti-sex worker law, commonly known as the Walking While Trans Ban, has been repealed, marking a major victory for sex workers and transgender advocates who have been pressuring state officials for years. The law, which prohibited loitering for the purpose of sex work, led to the disproportionate criminalization, police harassment and arrests of black and brown trans people. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show in Burma, where the military seized power Monday in a coup, ousting the de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Earlier today, Burmese police charged the former Nobel Peace Prize laureate, as well as Burma's deposed president, U Win Myint. Hundreds of lawmakers, activists and human rights defenders have also been detained since Monday's coup. Telecommunications have been cut in parts of Burma, which the military calls Myanmar. On Tuesday night, opponents of the coup protested by banging pots and pans outside their windows in Yangon. Reuters reports staff at 70 hospitals and medical departments in 30 towns across Burma stopped work today to protest the military. On Tuesday, the Biden administration formally declared the military's action to be a coup, prompting a review of U.S. foreign assistance to Burma. Monday's coup unfolded hours before lawmakers were to take their seats in the opening of parliament, following a November election in which the military made unsubstantiated claims of fraud. In the election, Aung San Suu Kyi Xi's party won over 80 percent of the contested seats in the Burmese parliament. Aung San Suu Kyi spent years fighting against the Burmese military, winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991 for her efforts. She spent 15 years under house arrest before becoming Burma's de facto civilian leader in 2016. But in recent years, she's been condemned for presiding over a campaign of violence by Burma's military against the minority Rohingya Muslim community, which saw over one million Rohingya flee to neighboring Bangladesh. 
Many displaced Rohingya fear the coup will make it impossible for them to return home. This is Mohammed Salam speaking from the refugee camp in Cox's Bazar. Now in Myanmar, the military have declared a one-year state of emergency. That announcement is not good for the Rohingya people, too, because the military, together with the Rakhine people, tortured us a lot and carried out genocide. Then they made us homeless. We are now away from our home in Bangladesh, living under tents. Where is our children's education? There is nothing here for us. Now their military governs again. There are no benefits for us. They have arrested the democratic leader with military force. The fact they arrested such a leader would not be good for the Rohingya people there. To talk more about the coup in Burma, we're joined by Mang Zarni, a Burmese scholar, dissident and human rights activist living in exile in Britain. He's co-founder of the Free Rohingya Coalition, as well as the Forces of Renewal for Southeast Asia, or FORSI, a grassroots network of pro-democracy scholars and human rights activists across Southeast Asia. Mang Zarni, thanks so much for being with us. Um, start off by talking about what happened this week. Talk about what unfolded in Burma. The country that the military calls Myanmar? Well, the military decided that uh, uh, they could no longer play this democracy game with Aung San Suu Kyi after two election cycles, uh, you know, starting 2015 and November 2022, and uh, uh, expect to beat Aung San Suu Kyi. So basically, what happened was that the military uh, is, uh, you know, uh, completely outfoxed uh, legally as well as, uh, you know, it, uh, at the poll. So that's why the military decided to wreck the game. And uh, what is interesting is what trick, you know, uh, there are personal factors that trigger uh, this coup of, on Monday. The commander in chief. A mayor online has a price tag on his head because he is named uh, one of the uh, criminal or, or basically number one criminal against uh, uh, humanity with respect to uh, Rohingya genocide, and so that's one reason. And the, the other one is, of course, you know the they saw what happened on January six, uh, the the storming of the U.S. Capitol, and they saw what is going on in China, Russia. The ideological climate moving towards the far right around the world emboldened the generals that this is the time to end this democracy game with Aung San Suu Kyi. So can you talk about the U.S. response? You have um, President Biden issuing a statement where he refers to Burma, not Myanmar, as President Obama also did, referred to Burma. Uh, and the issue of whether to call it a coup d'etat. On Monday, Biden uh, said the U.S. is, quote, taking note of those who stand with the people of Burma in this difficult hour and urge the international community to pressure the Burmese military to relinquish power, lift restrictions on communications, and free all officials and activists who've been detained. He also suggested the U.S. may again impose sanctions on Burma. And, of course, if they call it a coup d'etat, it would require that they cut off aid to Burma. Yes, I think the call, you're designating uh, the coup uh, as, as coup, as should, it should be, uh, obviously automatically trigger immediate freezing of aid. But it's not a lot. I think like over a hundred U.S. million dollars. Uh, in the development or civil society aid or humanitarian aid to Burma. But I think, that, you know, I think we should also, uh, uh, you know, not forget the fact that the United States has uh, in some ways contributed to this situation. You know, in 2010, uh, when the, U the Burmese military decided to play ball with the Western democracies, they brought in this essentially a very limited form of democracy where the military generals play regions uh, to the uh, civilian uh, democ democrats. And so the last 10 years, we have lived with this, basically the big lie 
that we are democratizing and that this is a fragile transition with Suu Kyi at its helm. Well, on Monday, the military itself killed and buried that lie. So talk about Aung San Suu Kyi's role. She's been arrested. Um, the president has been arrested. Uh, now, today, the latest news is they're being charged, I think, she for having, they said, illegal radios, you know, gotten from abroad, finding that in her home. But the role that she has played, I mean, she was considered a freedom fighter for so long, won the Nobel Peace Prize under house arrest for so many years by the military, its chief critic. Then she became its chief spokesman person and justified um, what happened to the Rohingya um, uh, Muslims that were forced, ultimately, about a million of them, into neighboring Bangladesh. Now they have turned on her, the woman who has defended them for all these past few years? Well, you know, Amy, as you know, uh, the, the, I was a foot soldier uh, supporting her and uh, campaigning for her release. And then, you know, the, uh, B, uh, uh, the divestment and boycott campaign in the U.S. for the longest time. And, uh, you know, I saw her actually at the International Court of Justice uh, in a different room when she was actually defending the military and uh, denying the charges of, uh, of genocide. And, and so it, it's really painful uh, as a dissident to see the, you know, really uh, uh, the metamorphosis, metamorphosis of Aung San Suu Kyi from this uh, the human rights defender, uh, Democrat dissident, to, you know, uh, becoming the military's defenders, the spokesperson. Two things happened. One was she miscalculated uh, that, uh, you know, if she kept on placating the military, uh, the, which her father founded uh, some 75 years ago, uh, calling the military generals her brothers, because uh, they were, she considered them her father's sons. Uh, the, she thought that the military would cooperate with her to truly democratize the country and then uh, return to the barracks. Well, that proved to be wrong. We have all, I have always said uh, that this will not work. Uh, I came from an extended military family. The, the military has no interest in democratizing the country and no commitment to democratic values whatsoever. And the second reason is she herself is an anti-Muslim racist. She shares the view that Rohingya Muslims do not belong in Burma. That's a view the army has institutionalized and the public has embraced. embraced. So, so Bizarni, I wanted to the... go to Aung San Suu Kyi in her own words. This yeah. was back at The Hague in 2019, defending the Burmese military's treatment of the Rohingya. Regrettably, the Gambia has placed before the court an incomplete and misleading factual picture of the situation in Rakhine State in Myanmar. Yet, it is of the utmost importance that the court assess the situation obtaining on the ground in Rakhine dispassionately and accurately. The significance of this case um, uh, in The Hague, uh, Zarni, and then what will happen to the Rohingya now with the military seizing power? Well, I think the military has institutionalized the, uh, you know, genocidal persecution of Rohingyas since 1970s. And, uh, you know, there are uh, far more Rohingyas uh, uh, dispersed across the world than Rohingyas in the country. There are about half a million Rohingyas in open-air prison camps in Western Myanmar, about 120,000 in what the German officials call concentration camps. Uh, the, the rest are in, uh, you know, uh, um, these uh, vast uh, villages from where they cannot uh, leave. And then there is one million Rohingyas in Bangladesh waiting to be repatriated. We cannot, uh, uh, you know, expect uh, the perpetrators of genocide to welcome back the survivors of genocide. It is like uh, telling the Rohingya to go back to Auschwitz, uh, you know, telling the, uh, the victims of the Nazi 
of the SS to go back to Auschwitz because you've got uh, new bathrooms and, you know, new paint. So the repatriation is completely off the table. Well, I want to thank you, Meng Zarni, for joining us, a uh, Burmese scholar, dissident human rights activist. We'll continue to follow what unfolds, co-founder of the Free Rohingya Coalition, as well as the Forces of Renewal for Southeast Asia, known as FORCI, this grassroots network of pro-democracy scholars and human rights activists across Southeast Asia. When we come back, President Biden has halted deportations, he said of immigrants, and yet hundreds and hundreds of immigrants have been deported in the last days under the new administration. Stay with us. Rohingya musician Muhammad Alam, recorded in 2018 in Bangladesh as part of the Music in Exile project. This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We look now at President Biden's latest moves to undo the Trump administration's hardline anti-immigrant policies. In an address from the Oval Office Tuesday, President Biden built on executive orders he announced during his first week in office by signing three new orders. With the first action today, uh, we're going to work to undo the moral and national shame of the previous administration that literally, not figuratively, ripped children from the arms of their families, their mothers and fathers at the border, and with no plan, none whatsoever, to reunify the children who are still in custody and, uh, and their parents. The second action addresses the root causes of our migration to our southern border. And the third action, the third order I'm going to be signed, orders a full review of the previous administration's harmful and counterproductive immigration policies, uh, basically, across the board. One new order establishes a task force to reunify migrant families separated under Trump's zero-tolerance policy. It'll be led by Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, who was confirmed Tuesday by the Senate as the first Latinx and immigrant to lead the department. Mayorkas was born in Havana, Cuba, as the son of Jewish Cuban refugees from the Holocaust. Biden also ordered a review of the Trump policy known as Remain in Mexico that requires non-Mexican migrants to stay in Mexico as their immigration cases wind through court and has left tens of thousands of asylum seekers waiting waiting in dangerous conditions along the border. This is asylum seeker Marlin speaking to the advocacy group People Without Borders, Pueblo Sin Fronteras, uh, about facing homelessness with her family after being sent to Mexico. We vividly remember when we arrived to the immigration office in Mexico. They didn't give us a place to sleep or anything to eat. Our children slept on the floor that night. This comes as Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, has deported hundreds of immigrants in recent days, despite Biden's call for a moratorium, including a survivor of the 2019 mass shooting at the El Paso, Texas, Walmart. She was deported to Mexico last week. The woman, identified only as Rosa, had been cooperating in the investigation into the shooting. Local outlets report she was apprehended after a traffic stop for a broken brake light. This is Rosa speaking by phone with El Paso station KVIA. El 
when he told me I have to go and to the police station, I was really scared because I know they, they can deport me because that was my first thought. I want to testify, I want to ask him, I want to tell what, it, what happens and everything. I'm hoping to be there, be back, be okay. The Biden That's all I help. The Biden administration has also deported a man named Paul Pirillus to Haiti, who New York Congress member Mondaire Jones had worked to successfully stop the deportation just weeks ago, before Biden was sworn in. But around 3 a.m. Tuesday morning, he tweeted, quote, at 3 a.m., my staff woke up to an urgent call. Suddenly, and in the dead of night, ICE was set to deport Rockland County's beloved Paul Pirillus to Haiti, a country where he has never been, unquote. For more, we're joined by two guests. In Tijuana, Mexico, Erica Pinero is with us, an immigration attorney and the policy director for Al Otro Lado, in English, the other side. Also with us, Aura Bogado, senior reporter of Veal from the Center for Investigative Reporting. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Aura, let's begin with you. Can you explain what's going on? You have these executive actions um, that are extremely important, including one that calls for a halt to deportations. This is the president of the United States. And yet, hundreds of people have been deported under this new administration. What is going on? Thanks for having me, Amy. Um, what we're seeing is uh, quite a departure from the previous administration, and I don't want to discount the importance of appearances, the importance of the way that the president of this country talks about any human being, uh, including people who may be uh, detained or deported. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of really great language and the commission of a task force, um, uh, 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 another order, you know, to suspend deportations, and yet we see a continuation of the same practices that happened under President Trump and previously under Obama. Um, and I do think that there's a difference. There's absolutely a difference in, in tone. Um, but what we're seeing is, for example, with the commission of the task force, we're seeing DHS, uh, we're seeing DHS which is uh, the same agency that separated children at the border, now tasked with uh, figuring out where, where these families are. It's a little unclear what will happen after that. And I think that for a lot of people that I've been talking to in, in the last day or so since the executive orders were announced, uh, it doesn't really go far enough. And also um, sets a commission, in, in some case a, a task force, uh, for something that a lot of people voted on. Um, the Biden ticket uh, sort of stood against all of that, stood against those family separations. So the idea that we now need a task force to figure out how to move forward instead of having something in place, when uh, Biden also has uh, the House and the Senate, uh, rings hollow for a lot of people. Erica, I wanted to ask you about your clients Alvaro and his son Alvaro Jr., who just turned nine years old. The little boy said all he wants for his birthday is to be reunited with his father. They've been separated since he was six years old. This is Alvaro speaking to NBC News about the day the two were separated. An officer told me, give me your children's things, because you are going to different places. And I didn't know what was going to happen to my child. So, Erica Pinheiro, um, if you can talk about, among the executive orders, are this issue of separation. The hundreds, over 600 children still left, it's believed, um, uh, separated from their parents. Uh, in some cases, uh, the administration doesn't even know where the parents are. In hundreds of cases, they may well be in the United States, and another few hundred, they may be outside the United States. But, I mean, clearly Biden has put a top priority on this, because because the people serving on this committee are the secretaries of Homeland Security, Mayorkas just confirmed, the secretary of um, Health and Human Services, the former attorney general of California, Becerra, and the attorney general, yet to be confirmed, and First Lady Jill Biden. Talk about what this means. 
Well, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And I just want to mention that it's probably well over 600 families that are still separated. The, num the 600 number are the number of parents that have yet to be located. Um, so amongst that population, we're not sure who's still separated, who might be reunified. Um, but we are in touch with hundreds of families um, that have been separated for years and remain separated with no clear pathway toward reunification. I would guess the, the full number of separated families could be a thousand or more. Um, we're still not sure. Um, I am heartened like many others to see that there is a task force, that there is movement toward reunification. Um, but working with the families every single day, I can tell you that every day of delay feels like an eternity for, for a parent who's separated from their child. Um, I was disappointed to see in the executive order that the task force is given 120 days until their first report out and then periodic report outs after that. I would hope that the task force um, reunifies families on a rolling basis. Like I said, we're in touch with families now. They've been vetted. They're ready to come back. That's four um, months. The task force has given four months to study this. Right. And there's no indication that they'll begin any reunifications immediately. There's no indication that they'll bring back parents who've been deported without their children. And I can tell you from working on this issue that the government has fought those types of reunification, reunifications every step of the way. So I'm hoping that this task force is not another stall tactic um, to delay these reunifications. And I hope that Biden keeps his promise and actually reunifies these families. Tell us more about the Alvaros. Tell us more about Alvaro and his little boy. So... Alvaro, like many other uh, parents, was separated from his son at the border. He um, came to the United States seeking protection. Um, you know, in his case, they actually told him he was being separated. In other cases, um, agents told the parent, um, your, your child's just going to take a shower, they'll be right back, or you're going to court, when you come back, your child will be here. And then, of course, they never saw their child again. Um, in other cases, parents were tricked into signing their own deportation. They were told, um, your, your child will be on the plane with you or they'll meet you in home country. And then they get back to their home country and their child's still in the United States. Um, you know, like Alvaro and his son, many of these families are now going on three years of being separated from each other. And the children, um, for the most part, are not detained anymore. They're living with families or other sponsors, but um, in various situations. Some are in really precarious situations, have gone from house to house. And I've even talked to kids that are now homeless because they don't have anyone to care for them in the United States. And can you talk further, out of Bogado, about this absolutely critical issue? Um, as Erica said, every single day, when you're talking about children who are separated from their parents, every single day matters. It does. And um, I've spent a lot of time investigating family separations uh, in the previous previous administration. In uh, Under the Obama administration, I published a, a big investigation at the end of last year uh, about a child who, uh, in 2013, was just 10 years old when she was separated from her family at the border. Um, she spent seven years, close to seven years, going from bouncing around from shelter to shelter. She was in Washington, in Texas, in New York, in Florida, Massachusetts, you name it. She was sort of all over the country. She started to believe that her family had abandoned her. Meanwhile, they were in North Carolina the whole time trying to figure out what happened to her. Uh, she was alone. She was drugged for a, a big chunk of that time. And she was 17 when she requested to be deported back to Honduras. Um, I was able to, to talk to her right around that time, and she was able to reconnect by phone with her family in North Carolina, but then never reunited. So she had her entire adolescence bouncing around, drugged in shelters from the age of 10 to 17. Um, you know, during that time, she hardly learned to read or write. She, she can't do either uh, very well. She can speak some phrases in English, but imagine your entire adolescence. Imagine everything you learned from the ages of 10 to 17. She didn't even have a hug during that time because that's not allowed uh, either with either other participants in the shelter she was in or with staffers. And now she's in a very violent situation back home in Honduras. So when Biden talks about this national shame, 
um, th this idea that we're going to have a task force to look at this very uh, discrete uh, number of families that fall under the specific scope under one summer during Trump, um, I do wonder uh, if we can also sort of take a moment um, and think about what truth and reconciliation means uh, in other examples, what we hold other nations to, uh, and whether we'll ever be able to really reconcile the, the violence, really, that's happened to migrant families at the border for years, uh, and, and also the public's attention. I mean, this was a really, really uh, heightened issue during the Trump administration, a lot of times used as a political football. There was a lot of posturing around this. And now we see a lot of celebration uh, for, for the uh, executive orders. Maybe a lot of change will come through it. Uh, maybe not. I mean, uh, if you compare Obama and Trump just on the numbers alone, one president deported far many more than another, and that was Obama. So we'll see what Biden does. I wanted to ask Erica Pinedo about the Remain in Mexico policy. Um, you're, uh, uh, you're in Tijuana right now, al otro lado, the other side. Um, talk about what exactly it is, who has to remain in Mexico, and what's happening to them. So two years ago, um, in January of 2019, uh, the Trump administration started the program known as Remain in Mexico. And basically what it does is forces uh, mostly Central American migrants, some South American migrants, um, even, you know, some random Haitian migrants, some random other migrants, um, to wait in Mexico for U.S. court hearings. When these immigrants are in Mexico and more than 65,000 have been sent to Mexico under this program, they're not given any kind of support in Mexico. Um, they're waiting in some of the most dangerous cities in the world along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, they are rarely communicated with regarding the future court dates, so court dates could change. A lot of people miss court because they're just not able to receive any communication from the U.S. courts. And um, I think by the end of the program, or by the time the program stopped um, about in March of 2020, uh, I think... 5% or less had access to an attorney. So as of March 2020, uh, the CDC order closed asylum processing at the border. Um, anyone who was still in Mexico waiting for a court hearing has been stuck here since then. Um, there's been, you know, the CDC order has been renewed every single month. There's no indication as to when people are going to be processed out. And when Biden was elected, there was a lot of hope amongst the migrants here that there would be a plan for processing them into the United States so they could continue their asylum hearings in the United States. Um, but as we've seen with these recent executive orders, there's they've been given no timeline. And I can say as an advocate working here in Mexico, um, people have been very patient in the face of really dire circumstances. You know, I've met dozens and dozens of families who've suffered assaults, rapes, attempted kidnappings. They've actually been kidnapped. Family members have been killed. They're homeless. They've lost their jobs. The pandemic has really had a disproportionate effect on this population. And, you know, we're really honestly very disappointed um, about the fact that the executive order does not have a timeline for processing. There's only so much and so far that the migrants will listen to us when we say, wait for the plan, don't rush the border, don't try to go to the port of entry, just wait for the administration to tell you what to do. You know, if we don't have an answer for these people, other groups will fill that information void like cartels and like smugglers. And ultimately, um, the lack of a plan is going to result in more migrant deaths. I wanted to um, give this update on today's headline. The Associated Press reports a dozen Mexican state police officers have been arrested for their possible involvement in the massacre of 19 people in the northern Mexican state of Tamaulipas. The officers face homicide charges. The 19 bodies were found shot and charred in a town near the U.S.-Mexico border in January. Relatives of asylum seekers from Guatemala say they believe some of the dead could be their loved ones, including teenagers who were trying to reach the U.S. Only four bodies have been identified, two Guatemalan, two Mexican. Do you know about this, Erica? Yes, I do. Can you explain? And the only surprise—sorry. Go ahead. The only surprising thing about this story is that the police were actually arrested. Um, you know, living on the border in Mexico, I can tell you that you know, I've tr personally tried to call the police countless times when migrants were 
raped. Um, I had a client who actually escaped a kidnapper um, by beating him with a pipe she found in the house where she was being kept with her child. Um, you know, we called the police and they didn't even want to come that day to take a report from her. Um, we've seen countless cases of migrants being extorted by immigration agents, being extorted by the police. Um, you know, when we try to report um, things like smuggling operations, we're told, you know, they're not going to do anything unless it involves child sex trafficking. You know, other types of smuggling is just not even a priority for law enforcement here. So it really doesn't surprise me at all that the police were involved, especially in Tamaulipas, where we've heard numerous reports of systematic uh, extortion, assault, kidnapping by security forces, by Mexican security forces. Um, so I don't really see um, a solution for this as long as the ports of entry remain closed to processing. Uh, migrants have no other choice but to really engage with smugglers to try to cross the border to seek protection between ports of entry. Um, and if they don't engage with smugglers, that's when they get kidnapped and killed, like we saw in this case. Uh, and, uh, Erica, I also wanted to ask you about your group, El Otro Lado, tweeting last night that it's joined several groups, including Louisiana Advocates for Immigrants in Detention, to file a civil rights complaint against ICE and LaSalle Corrections for their use of torture in making black refugees sign their own deportation papers. Um, what's happened here? Again, this is something that is unfortunately so common across the immigration system, but rarely comes to light because it's happening behind prison doors. Um, at LaSalle in particular, we've seen uh, systemic and continued torture of black migrants. During the pandemic, there were numerous incidents where detainees were not given PPE, they were pepper sprayed, they were put in solitary confinement, um, they're lied to about their legal rights. Um, so right now, although we are technically under a deportation moratorium, we've seen um, hundreds of black migrants being deported. It seems like they're emptying the detention centers into Haiti, which is experiencing extreme political turmoil right now. Um, and in the case of the Haitian migrants that are the subject of the complaint, um, they are being lied to. Um, they're you know, being told that they don't have an option to continue their cases. Um, they're being coerced by terrible detention conditions. And so the result is that people are being deported. To, to a very dangerous situation. Finally, out of Bogado, um, the president has issued an executive order to end all new contracts with uh, for-profit prison companies. But that's that are run by the DOJ, the Department of Justice. He hasn't talked about ICE, and we know about the horrific conditions in a number of ICE jails that are run by these for-profit companies. Ultimately, um, can you just talk about what you expect for uh, to see under Biden and and what you think is most important to address right now? Well, it's important to keep in mind that immigration detention is called detention, and it's not called imprisonment, because it's not technically punishment for a crime. These are people who are being held on civil charges. And again, for a ticket that ran on sort of rehumanizing an entire uh, population of, of migrants and immigrants, to continue this while uh, you know putting a pause on 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 other programs is not necessary. There is no uh, you know public health or public safety reason for why which people uh, and families must continue to remain detained. Um, I'm not sure exactly what we can expect from the Biden administration. Again, I do think that the tone is very important, and I'm not saying that in any kind of facetious way. I do think it's important that departure is really important. I do think that it's important to keep in mind that um, one of the people who was deported was a survivor of the El Paso shooting, and the ideology behind the gunmen was to literally massacre and get rid of a whole bunch of people that he didn't see as belonging to this country. So when we have this new administration going and deporting somebody who survived that crime, who likely was eligible for a U visa, and then literally getting 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 rid of that person, that does unfortunately fit uh, with a certain kind of xenophobia 
uh, that that is rampant in in this country. So I'm not sure what we can expect to see, but um, it's not so much as as a preview, but sort of the the, the early signs. Uh, I can't say that that I'm too surprised, but we we've got some signs about uh, what the what the next four years might look like for uh, immigration migration a, a different tone, um, maybe not different actions. Why independent reporting like yours is so important. Uh, Auto Bagado, I thank you so much for being with us, senior reporter at Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting, and Erica Pinedo, immigration attorney at Al Otro Lado Policy Director. Um, thank you for joining us from Tijuana, Mexico. Next up, Jeff Bezos announces he's stepping down as CEO of Amazon. This emits new calls to break up the almost two trillion dollar company. Stay with us. Sin neblina, diamantes cristalina, no lo es. Humilde hogar de la mina y cartón, estallan en el cerro con los rayos del sol. Nadie nos dará gobierno majestad, la necesidad es ajena, no sienten ni pena. Nadie nos dará gobierno majestad, la necesidad es ajena, no sienten ni pena. Allá donde no había, no se necesito permiso para la vida, soy rica en esperanza, si de reto no me niego. Le daré vista, le daré vista, hasta el más ciego. Soy rica I am here by Quetzal. This is Democracy Now! democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. Jeff Bezos has announced he's stepping down as CEO of Amazon, the $1.7 trillion company founded in 94. Bezos will remain as executive chair and the company's biggest shareholder. He's now worth about, oh, $185 billion after personally making over $70 billion since the start of the pandemic. Jeff Bezos will be succeeded in July by Andy Jassy, who runs Amazon's cloud computing division, its most lucrative division. Amazon announced the news as it reported record profits. On Tuesday, the company also reached a $61.7 million settlement with the Federal Trade Commission over charges it stole tips from its Amazon Flex drivers over two and a half years. Amazon used the tips earned by the Flex drivers to pay the wages of these hourly workers who don't receive any benefits and make deliveries in their own vehicles. This all comes as 5,000 Amazon workers in Alabama begin voting next week to decide whether to become the first unionized Amazon warehouse in the country. We go now to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Rob Weissman, president of Public Citizen, which is calling for Amazon to be broken up. Well, your response to the news, Robert Weissman, of, yes, Jeff Bezos is stepping down as CEO, but he clearly will still be extremely active, maybe even more active, at least in a public way, with Amazon. Right. We, there's no reason to think anything is going to change at Amazon because Bezos is taking this new role. Um, although, of course, it's a chance for the company to rethink its predatory business model. I don't think there's any reason to expect that to happen. So what does need to happen is for the government to step in and take much more serious action than it's ever really contemplated to restrain, control, and ultimately break up Amazon. It has too much concentrated power. It has a predatory business model. And neither the economy nor our democracy can really function properly with fairness if Amazon is able to maintain its massive concentration of wealth and power. So, um it's interesting he's stepping down at a time when, under this new administration, big tech is under scrutiny. Um, what that means, we'll see. But what would it mean to break up Amazon? How would that happen? Well, one thing that Amazon has done uh, throughout its quarter century of existence is leverage its is engage in predatory pricing and then leverage its power from one business line to grow in another or exact profits from another. So the company now, for example, actually makes more profits from its web services than it does from the consumer-facing company that so many of us are familiar with. Those two companies don't need to be joined together. 
um, they could be separated, and that would prevent the possibility, many think the ongoing practice, of Amazon effectively using the information it gets from its web services to figure out how it can market and profiteer on the consumer side. Uh, we also would want to see Whole Foods, which it recently acquired, spun off um, so that the company doesn't have an, an entry point by way of acquisition into then dominating uh, the grocery business, both for in-person and deliveries. Talk about this FTC decision. You know, this came down yesterday, just a couple hours before Bezos made the announcement, and it is just shocking. Um, it's not entirely shocking in the sense that companies engage in wage theft across the country all the time. So it's become routinized and normalized to some extent. But coming from Amazon, the idea that there are pocketing money that consumers give as tips to their drivers and not conveying those tips to the drivers, actually just saying, hey, we're going to use it to cover the cost of your wages, when, in fact, we, Amazon, advertise to you, our contract drivers, that you could keep these tips, just astounding. You just have to ask, why? How much? When is enough? What is the level of greed that you need? How much money does Jeff Bezos need? As it happens, this amount that's going to be returned to the drivers is about $60 million that Amazon allegedly un improperly and unfairly siphoned off from tips uh, to the drivers. Well, Jeff Bezos made a thousand times more than that since the pandemic and the increased stock value. A thousand times more. Why would you nickel and dime these employees? It is a company that has predation built into its business model. And that's one yet another reason it really has to be fundamentally restructured and reoriented. Uh, he says uh, he didn't say he's going to spend more time with his family. Um, he said he's going to spend more time with Blue Origin, his space company, um, and The Washington Post. What does this mean for news in this country? Well, who knows? He's also going to spend more time on his charitable enterprises, supposedly. I mean, you know, as a Washington resident, you have to say The Washington Post has become a better paper uh, and since Bezos bought it, and he hasn't really, by any way that we can see from the outside, interfered with it. Um, more engagement from him may not be a good thing. Um, but, the, you know, I think one thing that we're seeing is, like, well, maybe he should spend more time with his charity. All the other super billionaires do that, which is fine, maybe. But the problem is no one should have $200 billion personally in the first place to give away, especially when they made that gigantic amount of money by extracting it from their workers and undermining small businesses across the country. And explain that. Small businesses, uh, both completely dependent on Amazon, but also exploited by Amazon and what should be done. Yeah, well, I mean, what we're seeing in sector after sector is that small businesses are finding they, they can't Either they can't survive in brick and mortar traditional stores, or they can only survive doing that if they're also online. So they're moving their businesses increasingly online. But you really can't do a business online on your own. If you just rely on search, people to search your business out and buy from you, you're not going to make it. So then you have to move yourself to the so called Amazon marketplace. You've got to sell your products over Amazon. But once you do that, you get caught up into the rules of the game that Amazon establishes. And there is lots of evidence, including in a really detailed report from the, set, uh, from the House subcommittee on antitrust last year, that shows Amazon takes a lot of money from those small businesses. But they don't have any choice except to pay it. And then if those small businesses get too successful, Amazon, because of all their data tracking, knows about it and begins a, co a competing business on its own. Uh, so the small businesses feel like heads Amazon wins, tail they lose. They can't make it, um, but they have no choice but to try their best to work through and on Amazon. Rob Weissman, I want to thank you for being with us, president of Public Citizen. And that does it for our show. Democracy Now! produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dean Augusta, Libby Rainey, Nermit Sheikh, Maria Tarasena. Special thanks to Julie Crosby, Becca Staley. Wear a mask, wear two. Stay safe. I'm Amy Goodman.